those kids who understand that things can be hard, things can be good, and there's ups and downs, what they call the oscillating narrative, that those kids end up feeling more resilient when they're faced again with a challenge. Do you organize your books by color or only because you do these talks in front of them? No, no, I honestly, like, I, I'm almost shameful. It's embarrassing that I do. I feel like the Dewey Decimal system inside me, this is just blasphemy, frankly. And, but it's how I remember them is because I, I like to sort of get close to my books. And so I do remember the one with the white cover more than anything else. And so that's kind of ends up being why I do it this way. No, I'm I'm the same way. I have like a in, intrinsic, inherent objection to organizing books by color. And then when I moved into my office and in the other room, someone who's working for me put them by color. And it's so pretty that I don't want to undo it. And then it's been there long enough that now I kind of know where everything is. You have this kind of fingertip feel for where yes. books are. Totally. And then you're like, if I shuffle it around, I'll never know where they are ever again. No, I know. Well, I, one day I will master that Dewey Decimal System. I think I'm just sort of frustrated in my mind, but this is in such defiance of that. But I'm sure there must be that like critical mass moment where you just have to surrender and do it sort of much more methodically. I, I, it looks like only only partly done by height, which I, I'm actually more interested in organizing them descending by height. That like bothers me more if they're random, like this is a mess. And uh, these are books I actually use, but uh, I, I like to see them. I like the of the of the edges lined up. I could not agree more. And once I saw, I think it was Steven Pinker had like the coolest bookshelf. There was a book about how people pe how people keep their books, and he had these amazing like cartons that were like these squares that were done, and it's just oh. a, like kind of just a beautiful approach to keeping your books because then you could it allowed for the really like wider, longer ones, more coffee table kind of style size books, and sometimes there's little books that you just don't know where to put them because they get so lost, and so I, I thought that was brilliant in my next life. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, I, um, one of my, one of our things when I, when I got this office, uh, there's a bookstore downstairs. One of my wife's rules was that we would move all my books out of the house. So they would stop bothering her and <laughs> it would be very clear what was like house books, like for the kids and stuff. And then what is like my writing chaos books. <laughs> I, get, I, I get that though. Yeah, no, I think my husband definitely does not want to see any of the madness because I actually quite enjoy the confusion and having them all sort of sprawled around me and at my fingertips like that. Yeah, yeah. You want to you want to be this is why when people are like, oh, I listen to you on audio. I'm like, well, thanks. And, but <laughs> like physical is absolutely the way to go in my view. I totally agree. Well, uh, speaking of physical books, two different people that work for me uh, were raving about your book and then told me to read it. And they gave me their copy. These are the notes oh that they God. took when they read your book. So they really liked it. Wow. Thank you so much. I'm a yeah. huge fan of yours. And I, no I just way. love the, the Paul Bloom, the, the podcast. This I think maybe it was today. I don't know. It was like you had like a like four of like Annie Duke and yeah. Paul Bloom who's always just, you know, life ex, like mind expanding. And um, it was a, a bunch, but I, somebody about a year, two years ago. And so I was so <laughs> excited when I got an email from no the way. At Penguin saying that that you were inviting me on the podcast. It was just truly like a delight. Um, and uh, I kind of, I've been fangirling sort of for so long. So thank you. Well, that's amazing. I had heard about you uh, from that New York Times profile when, whenever that was like a couple of years ago. Yeah. Thank you though. Thank you for following up and I really appreciate it. Well, I'm excited. So let's, let's start with the idea of vitality because vitality is an interesting word. I think when people think about like, what they want their life to be, you know, you're like, describe your, your ideal life in a word. Um, I think they might say like successful or they might say fun or happy. I feel like weirdly vitality would be pretty far down that list. Like if we're thinking about the, the, the ranking, like we're doing this like family feud style, but it, it's actually a really good word to describe what a good life is. Well, yes, you know, it was a word that I really didn't hear much in my training to become a psychiatrist. It was not a word I really heard out in the world other than when Richard Simmons was talking about like a vitality and it was sort of associated with elderly um, people. But 
it was such an important word because it also implied an everydayness to it. Mm. Like there was something um, about your daily existence to feel vital. And it contained both, you know, your emotional, like the psychological experience that you have each day, but also that physical experience. And there was a wonderful quote from Andrew Solomon that he had once said that the opposite of depression um, isn't happiness, it's vitality. And that sense of sort of how are you living your life um, in that everyday way. And to me, it was sort of something that had been shortchanged in our in our psychological health, certainly, that we hadn't focused on it enough. And I really wanted to bring it back into the conversation. And the more I spoke about it with patients, and I had gone back to school and studied applied positive psychology, and that's where it had sort of bubbled up here and there, but much more in the physical sense. And I really wanted to bring it more into like the psychological domain as well. Yeah, well, like if I'm thinking about both definitions, right? It's like sort of important or essential, but then it's also like energy and vivaciousness there there it, it 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 has this sort of dual meaning and maybe that's why people don't immediately come to think about describing their goals or their life as wanting to be vital yeah no it's it's not it's not seen as something like an essential sort of yeah need or i i must say nobody's ever come to my office being like i just want to feel vitality yeah but i think that was all the more reason i wanted to shine this light on it and there was a moment where we were going to call my book and maybe it would have been better for marketing purposes everyday strong oh. that might have probably had more appeal to people and i, I mean the cover you know it, it doesn't look like it's about weightlifting um or anything. But, but what, you know, I really wanted to kind of shine that spotlight on it and see if it it, it did sort of get some pickup. And I'm not sure that I, that I have fully succeeded in any way. But I do think I've brought it into the conversation, or I hope I have. And I hope that it's something that people are thinking about a little bit more deliberately. And that other side of it, that it really does, I do think, apply to our everyday life, like that idea of feeling vital on a daily basis. What does that mean to you? And uh, sort of what are those steps that you are taking to energize yourself psychologically and physically and that vitality is a verb, you know, that it's something that you are not, you don't have, or you don't have it. Like it's something that you're kind of working at every day. Well, but actually though, like, so the second definition, this idea of like liveliness and energy and excitement and energy that, that, that I think that makes sense. Like that's what people want. Nobody wants, nobody's like my ideal life Every day I want to be boring. I want nothing to be happening. You know, I want nothing going on. So I like that. But then and then I'm I'm making up that the second part about sort of essential, like, you know, your vital organs or whatever. That's also what we need to thrive as human beings is that we need to have purpose and meaning. You know, we need to 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 be for some sort of good, like our our, our presence should mean something. So it actually does strike me as like kind of a perfect word to describe what you should want to get out of life. It's just interesting to me that that's like maybe not what we think. Yeah, no, I, I love the way you frame that and you're, you're thinking about it. And increasingly, I had begun to see patients who who were walking in the door. You know, there's always that moment between like you're kind of recommended to see somebody, but what actually makes you pick up the phone and then what makes you physically walk in the door, keep that appointment or these days hop on Zoom. And people used to come at these major inflection points in their lives, like there was something major going on and some um, some sort of clean cut or some switch, some, some transformation, some major inflection point. And I started seeing people more and more just who were having a really hard time dealing with everyday stuff. And really in that like space of lacking vitality, that kind of just keeping their head above water, getting by, but just like playing that game of every day, that whack-a-mole of just not like maybe just getting it done, but just by the skin of their teeth and feeling so devitalized um, and that kind of stress, tired, bored headspace of getting by. Do you, do you mean that in the sense of like uh, what Viktor Frankl called the existential vacuum, like things didn't have meaning, they didn't have purpose? Or do you mean it more in the like sort of fragile, not very resilient, able to handle the ups and downs of life? Both. I mean, mm -hmm. I think in that kind of that that vacuum, that that sort of existential void ultimately there of not feeling that they were living their life with their values, but then also just that drained, exhausted, um, physically 
sort of devitalized and, and, you know, not bringing that energy, I think, to their relationships, to their everyday life, to their connections, or even their values. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. And I, I was just to go back to what we we're talking about, sort of how you define life. I was just thinking about, you know, Ar Aristotle's concept of eudaimonia or eudaimonia, it, 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 which sometimes translate as happiness. But I guess the, the, the fuller translation is something like human flourishing. That's yeah. I what that's a synonym to me for vitality. Right. Like yes. you're flourishing as a human being in all the senses of that word. Yeah, no, absolutely. And Martin Seligman really has taken that word flourishing and, you know, I think really brought it to, to all of us and recognizing that the possibility and the potential in each and every one of us to flourish, but not in that. I mean, I think sometimes in our sort of short sighted ways, we have that more hedonic approach to having those moments of like, what's going to be that quick fix for me. And I talk a lot about the long cut, you know, like we, there are so many moments that it's just so much easier to engage in those efforts, sparing, you know, demand shielding activities that we do that just, you know, you end up feeling like a guilt, guilty couch potato, like all of those you know, and it's actually so devitalizing you, and, and talking to people, even after like a long weekend, they just want to, you know, watch TV and put their feet up and, you know, eat something that's not healthy. And that whole, that whole experience ultimately is so draining and they end up feeling worse afterwards, like on a Monday. And how do we kind of get over that hump? And there's so much messaging today about like, you've always got to be yourself and trust your feelings. And so, I mean, maybe this is where you, you and I align. It's how do you be, I ask people, be on you. Like, what is the opposite you feel like doing right now? Or who is somebody you really admire? Like, what would they do in this moment? And I think that that can get us closer to that version of ourselves we would like to be. Well, it's like the famous Costanza strategy, like do the opposite of whatever you think you should do, because yes. you, do, you doing what you think you should do has not worked out very well for you most of the time. You doing you, like don't order that tuna sandwich. Like what happens if you order, like do the opposite. But it really, it is those moments of sort of separating oneself from one's impulse, you know, or like that feeling. And sometimes I think as a psychiatrist, I'm supposed to be, you know, so fixated on people's feelings or their emotions or, and there's such messaging today to kind of trust your gut and to follow your feelings um, somewhere. And, you know, taking that healthy step back and breathing for a moment and gaining some distance between what you feel like doing and what's actually going to help you feel strong and better and to make a better choice. Yeah, it strikes me that at the core of Eastern philosophy, then Western philosophy, like Stoicism, and then even sort of modern psychology and psychiatry is the idea that you you not only have the ability to, but you must question your own thoughts and your own impulses and that you have the power to sort of interrupt certain patterns or redirect certain impulses or get to the bottom of emotions that you have. So, so some of this advice of like, just trust yourself, do what feels right is like the worst thing that you could do as a human being. Uh, no, absolutely. And I just think so much of like, you know, our training too is, is psychiatrist truth. We get really good at focusing on what's wrong with people and kind of helping them kind of feel less bad. And that's that whole focus on pathogenesis. That's the understanding um, and treatment of disease. And we're so much less focused on salutogenesis, which is the creation of health. And I think we see it very much in this either or way um, that you're, you're either sick or you're not sick. You have sure. an illness, you don't. And actually helping people find wellness within illness, finding strength within everyday stress, like having that both and that that sharing of that experience, letting even having what we call like emo diversity, like having, you know, those mix of emotions. We ask people, how are you feeling today? And they'll say good or bad. Like we have to have this binary, like it's one or the other. It's been a good day or it's been a terrible one rather than kind of looking at those multiple experiences, emotions, and they can even, you know, mingle that, that laughter through tears, those tears through laughter, like all of those experiences that are actually incredibly enriching and having that diverse ra range of emotions is, is part of, I think, like a full day, a full life, a full experience. 
Well, it's like uh, we were talking about Frankel earlier, the idea of finding meaning in your suffering, finding uh, that, hey, I don't control that X, Y, or Z has happened or that I have been dealt. Like I was just talking to someone the other day on the podcast who has this um, <clears throat> had this debilitating sort of speech impediment. And, you know, this is that is the hand that he was dealt. Right. Um his life is defined by the, the potential quality or lack thereof of his life is determined by his ability to respond to that. Like, what is he going to do with that? Like that his life is vital or uh, unvital in, insofar as he's able to make something of the fact that this is how he speaks. This is how his brain was wired. Right. And I think that that sort of that gets us to that space of sort of realistic optimism. You know, I think a lot of positive psychology deservedly gets, um, you know, that, that people look they don't look favorably upon it because it's seen as toxic positivity or just, sure. you know, smiley faces and, and rainbows and everything's just happy and you have to be happy all the time. And that even any experience that's negative, that we jump at pathologizing, there's something wrong with you, you're grieving, how can I medicate you? Um, but that looking at what people have, how, how, how that somebody can work within the limitations of what, what they've been given and seeing that as I was divided into sort of two domains is uncertainty and powerlessness. What are you certain about and what do you have power over? And that's the, uh, beyond that, like we, we can't, we have to sort of surrender those pieces. But there are certain things that we pretty much know and there are th certain things that we can control and to kind of focus one's energy on that and almost like take that surgical, you know, that scalpel and try to separate those um, domains out. And I think that that's where we come to that place of action rather because when we're so overwhelmed by that sort of negative space, it's really hard to feel that we have any agency. But when we sort of drill down and are able to kind of narrow and funnel what we can control and what we have power over, it changes the playing field and we're able to, to, to do something. And I mean, I sometimes I, I feel like psychiatry and psychology, it's this notion that happiness is all in your head. It's all up to you as the individual. And we really just interiorize this and not noticing how it's in the actions we take. It's in those connections we make and it's ha and how we participate. And I've had patients who have these, you know, breakthroughs or insights, but it doesn't necessarily get them anywhere if they're still doing the same thing. And there's an old psychologist who calls this insight imperialism. Like the idea that, you know, just because you've had that light bulb moment, you know, gee, you should have had a V8, but unless you're actually transforming something, you're doing something differently, it's not going to, it's not going to change you. It's not going to give you what you're looking for. When I wrote The Daily Stoic eight years ago, I had this crazy idea that I would just keep it going. The book was 366 meditations, but I'd write one more every single day and I'd give it away for free as an email. I thought maybe a few people would sign up. Couldn't have even comprehended a future in which three quarters of a million people would get this email every single day and would for almost a decade. If you want to get the email, if you want to be part of a community that is the largest group of Stoics ever assembled in human history, I'd love for you to join us. You can sign up and get the email totally for free. No spam. You can unsubscribe whenever you want at dailystoic.com slash email. Yeah, your your definition of optimism there is interesting to me. I, I've always found that um, when I when I read scholars on Marcus Aurelius, they're like, this guy was kind of dour and depressive and resigned, you know, um, that it was dark. And I, I think about it and I go, well, look at his life. He buries multiple children. He lives through a plague that kills millions of people. He loses his uh, father at an early age. He loses his mother. Uh, he lives in the Roman Empire, a time of immense corruption and uh, evil and, and cruelty and brutality. Um, it's sort of one thing after another. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of of the mind that the fact that he got up every day, uh, first and foremost, second, that he would ponder philosophy, that he tried to be a good person, that he kept going, he showed up for work every day, that this was 
these were statements of immense optimism and fortitude and strength. Like this would have killed a lesser human being. So I think sometimes we think about like we, we judge like, is this person walking around with a huge smile on their face? If so, they're an optimist. That might be crazy. <laughs> like actually what's optimism uh, or resilience or, or sort of real bravery is just the walking around part. Like, like just being a human in a fucked up world and not giving up and quitting is, is an immense act of courage. Absolutely. And I love the way you're describing that because it's really embodied optimism. It is getting out of bed. It is showing up. It's actually what you're doing. It's not sort of, you know, thinking happy thoughts or dreaming that he was going to sort of have this wonderful, cushy life tomorrow. I mean, he was super realistic and just putting that one foot in front of the other. That is embodied optimism. Yeah. Well, it's funny you say embodied optimism because he says at, w at one point, the, the Stokes say, like, don't talk about your philosophy, embody it. You know, so talking, hey, everything's great. You know, that that's well and good. But really what matters is like, what are you saying with your actions? Are you saying like, I have a will to live? You know, I see a light at the end of the tunnel. I believe this has meaning. You know, the little decisions we make, like um, getting up and doing the dishes instead of letting them pile up in uh, in the sink. Uh, the decision to put on, like, take a shower and put on fresh clothes and go outside. These are statements that 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 actually say, I think, a lot more than we think they do. They say, like, things matter. That, like, like, I care. You know, um, like, uh, I'll be here tomorrow. Like, the, we're we're actually making little statements about you know our values and about the future by nature of these seemingly mundane actions we take in the present moment. Well, I love, I mean, it's a truly, and that's how we're kind of closing that intention action gap when we're doing that. And I think that sometimes we don't even acknowledge those little things. Like we don't give ourselves even credit for showing up and doing the dishes or following through or returning that call. And we never at the end of the day think of, oh, here's my already done list, you know, of great things I did. Um, and, you know, wow. But actually, when we do take a moment to think of just like our daily lives, there's a lot that we put out and put into them and acknowledge it and recognize it. I there's a wonderful poet who wrote um, a book about basically delight hunting. It was called The Book mm. of Delight. And I read it during the pandemic. And it's by Ross Gay. And he he deliberately decides to delight hunt every day and to write a small essay on on something that delighted him and how he talks about how he builds his delight muscle over time and how how he really learns and it's sometimes the most sort of mundane interaction somebody asks him to hand up hold a plant on a flight is there sort of trying to you know, put their suitcase in the overhead bin, just these little moments of connection that we do fail to recognize or not see. And I'm thinking of Ellen Langer's work where she talks a lot about the essence of mindfulness is actually just noticing new things and how we kind of wear these blinders where we're just shutting down all the time. And she talked about when, you know, couples who've been married for 30 years, they come into her office and just say, oh, I'm so sick of her. I'm so, you know, sick of the other person. Here she goes again, or and how we start just predicting how somebody else is going to behave. We know the end of the movie and this is the way they're going to be. And she said, nobody's ever come to my office and said, I'm you know, so sick of my dog or I'm so sick of my child or I'm so sick of my plant even because we're kind of expecting them to change. We're primed to watch them do something different or to be a little bit different in the world. Whereas with our partners, we just sort of fail to see that and we're just completely blind to it. So her advice always was look for something slightly different about them. Find one or two things that you notice about them. that's not the same, but that's different. My, it's funny, actually, uh, my wife and I were just uh, downstairs talking about our dog. We have a 15 year old dachshund that we got when we first started dating. And uh, we we're just like, you know what? We're ready. Like she, we're, we're ready for her to go anytime because we actually are quite sick of our dog. But uh, <laughs> that, 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 that's a that, that's a digression. Um, you know, <laughs> um, the, but the idea of delight is really interesting to me because, um, again, yeah, the the point about sort of putting the values into practice that when you go through the world like a poet or an artist who notices who notices what's special or interesting or delightful about something, 
um, you see a lot more than someone who sort of takes things for granted. And some of the most beautiful passages in Marx Aurelius' meditations are him noticing the way bread cracks open, or he talks about one of my favorite ones. He talks about the way that a stalk of grain uh, bends over um, uh, uh, hung by its own weight, right? The weight of the stalk of grain, as it grows tall, it starts to bend over and you go, yeah, there, there's certainly moments of darkness a- in the writing. And certainly he experienced, you know, warfare and uh, a plague and all these things. Yet if he's still noticing, you know, the way that, you know, uh, bread looks in the oven, um, there's something to that, right? Like I, I like when I go out to my car in the morning and it's like, oh, a cat's been here. You know, you look at like the little cat mm-hmm. footprints, like in the dust in your car. I always I always try to look for those little things that, that are special or cute or, you know, just sort of highlight the absurdity or daintiness of life. To me, that that's that's something that can always balance out whatever dark shit is happening at the same time. But you have to be looking for it. And that's the thing. I think you have to sort of override yourself and your inclination to look down, to certainly look at our phones and be primed to see it. And when you are delight hunting, you know, you're much more likely to see it. And then you want to share it with some somebody. And it is those little moments. I try to take like a different walk to work every day or just to see something that's slightly different. And you're right, that sort of internal smile you get, which is just something funny or amusing that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. But it's only when you're looking for it, um, you know, or when you're feeling fully present. Somebody said to me the other day that, um, you know, be wherever your feet are. Sure. And I, I love that idea. It just sort of says it all, but kind of that sense of noticing what's around you, soaking it in, kind of absorbing that. And, and you know, with wide eyes looking around you, you know, I think so often we walk into, you know, we're, we're sort of walking with blinders on, or at least it's as though we're always walking into a dark room and with a flashlight in our hand, we're just sort of looking into the corners to look for where the cockroaches are going to be. And we don't lift it up. And we're not seeing, a, maybe there's a painting on the wall. Maybe there's a window. Maybe there's another doorway to something beautiful. And it's kind of, how do we remember? And it doesn't come naturally to most of us. It's not something that, you know, is just that obvious sort of experience that we're seeking. And I think it's why I always talk about deliberately, like, you know, deliberate vitality and deliberate resilience. Well, yeah, you, you said, uh, talking about that book, that it's the idea of building the delight muscle, the muscle that notices the thing instead of glossing over it or taking it for granted or or even like cynically dismissing it, like wh- how it could be better or what's wrong with it, right? Like, uh, it, it actually, it takes a certain amount of presence, as you said, but it also takes a certain amount of sort of conscious discipline to not do the opposite. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. And it's something that honestly, for me, it's like Groundhog Day. Like if I don't deliberately try to do it, I mean, I think my, my natural inclination is more inward and internally driven and more fearful. I think I'm probably more in defense mode than discover mode than more often than I would like to be. But I've also learned that I can override that as well. Well, Groundhog Day is an interesting thing to bring up because it's also we live our lives as if it's Groundhog Day doing the same thing over and over and over again. And it's only when you step back and like, as you said, take a different walk to work or, you know, uh, put on a different kind of you know pair of glasses or you know, whatever, that you can see the environment which has kind of receded into the background or the people in your life which you have come to, you know, see as uh, as predictable or whatever, that you're able to see them sort of fully anew in the moment that you're in as something special and unique um, that you're not taking for granted. Yeah, I mean, it's why the pandemic, I think, was so interesting, too, is it, we were forced um, to completely sort of have new routines, develop new habits, um, spend time with, you know, that s- smaller group of people. And there's a lot of research around this, how it's only in experiences of forced experimentation do people really change their behavior in the long term. And it's this, these when we have these external kind of guardrails put around us, but that doesn't mean that we can't, we just have to be more disciplined about it. And You know, I think we often focus so much in my business on motivation, self-control, 
And that's great, but it comes and it goes sometimes. So how do you feel like, what can you do to make the decisions that you want to make easier for yourself? How do you make the, you know, how does it keep in line, like sort of with your values and to be more deliberate about them and close that intention action gap. And there's a lot of research around there about mental contrasting. It's not just thinking that, gee, I'd really like that. Um, but, you know, so identifying the obstacle in the way that is stopping you from doing that and then developing a very specific and concrete plan, like, oh, I'd like to look at my phone less because then I feel more present. I'd have better conversations with my partner and my kids. Okay, so what's stopping you from doing that? Well, it's in my hand, you know, when I pick them up from school or when I'm at dinner. Okay, so I'm going to turn it off or leave it, you know, in another place. So you're really having those very specific plans because otherwise like positive thinking gets us nowhere. We end up actually feeling worse in the long term, disappointed, frustrated um, and upset and kind of devitalized in the process. Yeah, it's I think a lot of people woke up during the pandemic and realized for the first time that they hate where they live or they hate their job or in some uh, less humorous spouses, they uh, 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 humorous uh, scenarios, they really don't like their spouse or th just things that had receded into the background or because they were so busy or preoccupied or distracted that they never really thought about it. And then they were like, oh, this isn't working for me. Yeah. No. And, and and that, I mean, I think there were so many surprises that emerged from that. We thought there'd be an explosion of divorces, people actually having this new appreciation for their partner. And also for the first time realizing like, oh, that's what they do, you know, and having the sense of, you know, having no clue prior to that. And that people did get closer, though. I did just read this study about how if in our everyday lives, having a diverse, like a range of interactions with people. Like, of course, it's wonderful to spend time with our loved ones. Parents these days spend less time with their friends. They spend more time on their children yeah. and how having that range of experiences, you know, so if you're, it's a Saturday and maybe you're spending like most of the day with your partner, it's probably if you spent 10 hours together, spend like that that 11th hour is not going to have that added benefit than if you would, you know, maybe spend a little bit more time, like making a, you know, an appointment to see a friend, go for a walk in the park with them, do something that engages your brain. Because in those moments, you get to wear a different hat. You get to be a different person. You embody a different um, like role with them and how important that is. Otherwise, we sort of get stuck. We're on autopilot when, you know, we're with our nearest and dearest sometimes. And sometimes switching hats and then coming back to each other is 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 very important for our connection. And the idea that you need to spend all your time together, they need to be your one and only, I think is actually a bit of a myth. Yeah. Well, so speaking of of, of changing gears, when I when I wrote The Obstacle is the Way, uh, which is a, a subtitle similar to yours, uh, yours is turning strength uh, stress into strength. I said, you know, the 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 art of turning trials into triumph. Uh, the question I probably got the most often was like, what's the biggest obstacle you faced in your life? Or like, what's the worst thing that ever happened to you? Um, which I've never really had a good answer for. And then when I was reading your book, I was struck by uh, what, what I think is one of the best lines. You said, you know, any idiot could handle a crisis. It's the day to day life that wears you down. Um it's Chekhov. It's not me. Oh, oh <laughs> Which, no, yeah. no, no. Sorry. But but I but but I think um we do tend to think of adversity or difficulty as this like thing that hits you once, as opposed to being kind to ourselves and understanding that life itself is fucking exhausting and difficult and full of stresses and struggles and, and that sort of um, it's okay for that to wear on you as a person. Well, no, absolutely. And I think sometimes we're messaging people to, you know, that you shouldn't have any stress in your life. And like when you're stressed out, it means you're committed, that you care, that you're invested, that that's important too. And to have that sort of desirable difficulty, that like kind of those chosen challenges Paul Bloom speaks about. But what really struck me about this resilience research, um, and resilience was not a word, by the way, I heard in my medical training at all. Mm. And it was, you know, suddenly it's a word we hear all the time and, you know, resilience gets thrown around as, you know, your hair product's going to make your hair more resilient. But it's, it's actually, there's a lot of research about it now. And what surprised me so much was that 
people in general tend to have big R resilience, that in general, people do recover from major setbacks in their lives, that it's not something that you're special if you have this. This is not something that just the lucky few are born with. It's something, it's the default, actually. And that we, you don't always need, you know, whenever there's a crisis, people want, you know, psychologists to rush there. Or maybe you need to talk to somebody. And, you know, a lot of the evidence shows that people are going to do just fine over over time. And but what is what really struck me was that what people have less resilience to, they have um, what I call like little R resilience is they lack that in the everyday stuff like that barrage, those irritations, those annoyances that just, you know, the daily grind that just drains us and leaves us exhausted and devitalized. And what makes people feel better? It's a lot of those like sort of actions, connections, doing doing stuff that is commensurate with their values. And, you know, if you look at these, like the lists of what makes people feel strong and gives them a boost, it's engaging in their hobbies, spending time outdoors, doing things with others, doing something for somebody else. Way down on that list is talking to a therapist about my problems, you know? And so that's where, like, I, I just was so interested in these ways that how do we build little our resilience? Like we know, and these days, you know, I, I love that book. It was great called maybe you should talk to someone and yeah. it was, you know, it was a wonderful book, but I think that's our response right now to anybody having a hard time. It's like, maybe you should talk to somebody and you know, what else could they be doing to also help them feel strong? Like what, maybe are they not getting enough sleep? Like, are they, right. you know, looking at their phone? Like, are they, could they be moving more? Could they be connecting more? And I think there's a lot of other reservoirs of little R resilience that we just need to remind ourselves to tap into. Yeah, I think people don't, people know those things work, you know, what time you wake up, what time you go to bed, how much screen time are you doing, how much are you drinking, um, how much water are you drinking, you know, mm -hmm. these like basic things. We're, we're really, but we don't want to be the kind of person that like undersells or, um, makes light of the struggle that someone has. So we don't want to go, oh, you know, you're super depressed. It's because you're uh, not sleeping enough, right? So so we kind of outsource like solving the problem to this sort of one size fits all thing of therapy. Like go talk to someone, that will solve it. But the reality is it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a both, you need both. You need to do these totally. basic things. And then probably also uh, if that's not doing it, escalate you know, escalated up the chain of command. Well, was, I think we've become so uncomfortable with people's negative emotions, with grief, with sadness, with anger, with frustration. And, you know, to sweep that under the rug or like, don't talk about it. There's like not space that we hold for that. And, you know, that the, there's a lot to be learned, you know, from those experiences and when we are feeling that certain way. And I guess the, the key is to try to be as specific as one can about what one's feeling and experience why, but I always think of it as data points, you know, because when we're learning from our negative emotions, when we're leaning into them, that's how we actually realize, like that's when we stop doing those same patterns over and over again that we, you know, we were talking about. We stop repeating that um, the, the same habits that are getting us into that place. It's sort of taking that step back and recognizing that. Um, so I, I might be a positive psychiatrist, but I'm a big believer in learning from those negative emotions and sort of leaning into them and learning from them. Yeah, I, I you know, Obviously, there's something like a pandemic happening and there's a loss of someone you love. There's being born in this country or that country. There's, you know, you're you're born in this race or that race. There's all these big things that can fall on you. Um, but then there's there's just the shit that happens in life. Like I was talking to my wife about this, uh, like in the span of like two days or the same day, like I realized that like an idiot, I had forgotten to renew my passport and I'm supposed to leave the country uh, like on Saturday. And so now I have to drive to Houston uh, for an 8 a.m. appointment. So I'm gonna have to get up at like four in the morning. I'm gonna have to spend all day at a government office, you know, hoping that some bureaucrat will bless me with these magical papers so I can leave. If not, I'm gonna have to cancel this thing, which is gonna cost me a bunch of money. People are gonna be really mad at me uh, and I'll feel really stupid about it. And then at the same time, 
it's like my youngest was supposed to enroll in school, but then we didn't get the email for enrolling. And let's just like, if it didn't happen, you know, enrollment opened at nine. And if you weren't enrolled by nine Oh six, like all the spots are, you know, and you're just like, but, but we were dealing with it. And I was like, we didn't get like short with each other one time about it. Neither of us spiraled about it. We just like did what we were supposed to do. And then we went on with our life. Right. Like that's to, I was like, that's what we're working on. Like that's the, that's it. Right. Like, can you just like not be wrecked by the fact that a bunch of stuff is going sideways at the same time? Could be huge stuff. You could be living in Ukraine right now, which would obviously be crazy on a fundamentally different level. Or it could just be the fact that, you know, you were booked to fly across the country on December 26th and you had a multi-leg flight on Southwest and, mm, uh, yeah. you know, it could be big or small. And, uh, how do you handle it? That that's what you're working on getting better at. Well, and that's where, like, because I think those gusts of wind are always coming at us. Like, you know, I, I think of it as kind of that, that tumbleweed experience. Like mm. We just feel tossed around by those gusts of wind and that we have no control. And it really does feel so out of control. But that essence of little R resilient, resilience is trying to kind of keep that, that internal compass, that core, those values front and center and not being as derailed um, by it. I always think of it, and I do this all the time, like when it's raining out and I'm walking outside with an umbrella and I keep walking around, but then like probably like an hour later, whatever that is, I realize, wait, the rain stopped, you know, and that sure. you have that weird moment of, wait, you, you're still behaving as if, like you're sure. still in that place of the storm, and that, you know, that, so you've got probably, you know, the, the analogy being like your adrenaline's up, like you are in defense mode, you sort of ready to swing at anything that comes your way. And I think so often we are walking around with that umbrella up and not looking around and be like, wait, the sun's already come out an hour ago, or I don't even know when. It's sort of embarrassing how long you've been doing this and probably, you know, veering people have to veer off the sidewalk to avoid you. But how do we be more deliberate? And I think it's, again, every single day, it's not that you have it or you don't, it is Groundhog Day. And I think that that little R resilience is something that we have to to work on. And it's often in those moments where we're, we're kind of transcending ourselves, like we are doing the opposite of what we feel like doing, or, you know, probably having that being irritated with one's partner for not you know, signing your kid up earlier for school or whatever that thing is, or realize being furious with yourself for not remembering your passport was going to expire. I mean, you can spend time in that place or you can kind of choose also and be deliberate about how you're going to go about your day and not let it hover over you the way that it easily can. Well, one of the things you talk about in the book, which is what I think I would have been primed to do you know, not just earlier in my life, but like had I circumstances been slightly differently, I woke up slightly on the different side of the bed, um, I would have spiraled or catastrophized. Like, because I did this, this is going to happen, then this is going to happen, and then this is going to happen. And then the stress of that would have sort of overwhelmed me or, you know, made me lash out in some way. So talk to me about catastrophizing. I mean, catastrophizing, I think that comes also really naturally to most of us. I'm probably a queen catastrophizer in ways. But when, you know, when you're envisioning that worst case scenario, it's all doom and gloom. Nothing's ever going to get better. And really the main problem of that is it like really, it deprives us of opportunities, of, of doing things, of taking action, of realizing our potential. And if we you know, have an experience um, with some somebody or something like you go on an interview for a job and there's something ambiguous in that interaction, then you immediately interpret that in the worst possible way. That person hated me. I probably did a horrible job. I thought I was an idiot. And then you don't follow up. You don't necessarily send an email thanking them because you're already convinced it's over, you're not getting that job. And so it's the consequences of catastrophizing that can be catastrophic in a way. And so how do you override that? And Martin Seligman also, he's um, come up with uh, you know, this, I, this exercise he calls put it in perspective and where he's, you know, allows you to think of, okay, what is the absolute worst thing that could happen here? Like, oh, uh, they hated me. I'm not getting my, that job or whatever. And then consider what's the absolute best case scenario. You know, they love me. They're going to double the salary. Like, this is amazing. I'm going to have the best job there. 
And then what's the most realistic outcome here? And so when you can sort of recognize and hold together those two extremes of the worst case, the best case, and then the most realistic outcome, you know, it kind of puts you back to that place of realistic optimism we were talking about of being, um, of putting things in perspective, having some clarity, and that can take us off the ledge a little bit of that place where we're just so quick to spiral downwards. And, um, and I think when we're also deliberate in our everyday ways about more uplifts in our day, like there's so many hassles, how can we be deliberate about having more uplifts, like moments of joy or delight or recognizing something that makes us laugh or that makes us feel strong or we're doing something for somebody else. It helps balance. It creates a balance between all these hassles and the uplifts can kind of weigh the scale in the other direction and makes us sort of more open to new experiences, to, you know, um, exposing ourselves to maybe, maybe seeing that ambiguous situation in a more positive light. So I think that's another way to kind of protect us from that slippery slope of catastrophizing. Well, I'm glad you brought up that tension because there is a tension, right? Like the Stoics talk about how um, you want to anticipate stuff. Seneca says, you know, the unexpected blow lands heaviest. He says the only uh, inexcusable thing for a leader to say is, I did not think that would happen. Mm. And then he also says, you know, we uh, suffer more than we need to. He says we suffer more in imagination than in reality. He says we suffer before our time. Basically, he's saying, like, you got to think about everything that could happen uh, so you're prepared. And it's, But also, don't be anxious and don't catastrophize. Yeah, well, it, you know, it reminds me of that Alex Honnold who climbed El Capitan, you know, and that that he would think about and imagine in his mind every possible scenario, every gust of wind, every mosquito that could come out and bite him. But then he also would do it and practice it over and over and over again. And so I think that idea of somebody who's thinking about it, imagining different case scenarios, but also taking action, participating, like doing that thing that um, isn't leaving him paralyzed with fear. I mean, fear is healthy. Like this is something we need in our lives. This is what actually can keep us safe, but not when it's taking us to that extreme. So what, how do we sort of uncouple fear from that paralysis that can kick in? And I think by kind of engaging in those exercises and overriding it is a way to let fear have its place, but not subsume us. Yeah, and I, I think if you're thinking about what could happen constructively and then taking, you know, reasonable, uh, you know, sane actions in response to that outcome so that you're not caught off guard or wrecked by, you know, you're just sort of normal preparedness or contingencies, that's not the same as being paralyzed because you're dreading, you know, what may or may not happen. Um, not only is that thing very unlikely to happen, but you're you're just like, all, all you're doing is emoting out into the world as if that's as if that's making the thing that you dread more or less likely. It's really just torturing yourself. Yes. No. And it's again like the the idea of you know people don't events aren't necessarily traumatic. They're potentially traumatic. It's how we interpret mm. them, how we experience them. And I, you know, I often meet patients who have, like they're in this space of like the as soon as kind of life, like they're in that, like as soon as all my ducks are in order, then I will do this. Or as soon as that happens and kind of waiting, sitting there waiting for something to happen. And it's really driven often by fear of taking that step or doing that thing. And it just seems so overwhelming and it's very much fear driven. And being able to, you know, just take that for like put one foot in front of the other and say like, what am I really waiting for? Like, let's just break this down. What's that one thing I can do to get me closer to that place that I'd like to be? Yeah, it's like if I'm, if I'm getting up and I'm working on making a little bit of progress or a little bit of preparation, awesome. If I'm just waking up defined by my dread or worry, I'm probably not doing it right. Yeah, and, but I mean, but allowing that space, I think for that dread and worry, like I think it's so, it's, it's, it's information, like it's there to help us and even to guide us. And maybe we're the last ones sometimes to know it's our friends who can help like us be like, wait a minute, maybe you should talk to somebody or maybe you're not like you sure. are spinning your wheels. And 
I think sometimes we need to be careful too with people we spend time with who we engage in that um, not necessarily productive connection, which is just in rumination when we're just spinning our wheels and we're just, it's, you know, we're having that same conversation over and over again. Like, and you know, you're co-ruminating with somebody and you're like, didn't we talk about this last week? You know, and like, I thought we covered that. And it's not helpful to co-ruminate with our kids or our friends, you know, and that actually just kind of doesn't help them reconstruct what the issue is. They're just repeating it. They're actually just reliving it over and over again. And so it's interesting, you know, the research around this, when you ask people to just self distance, you know, when you kind of create that distance between yourself and how you're feeling and asking them, like, what would your future self think about this? Or what would you tell a friend in this situation? Trying to, how would a fly on the wall, how would they describe this at this point to you? Because asking them to kind of remove themselves from it rather than immerse themselves in their feelings, which when they're ruminating, it's, they're literally like a ruminant, like a cow chewing their cud, you know, here we go again. And it can feel kind of cozy a little bit to ruminate with somebody. It can kind of feel good or bonding initially, but then you realize like you're just repeating that same conversation over and over again. And it's not necessarily helpful to them or to you to be in that space, help them reconstruct it, help them self distance and find a path through it. Well, I also think to go back to what we're talking about, some of these basic practices, it's like, if you get out and go for a run, if you're a member of a group, you know, if you have these sort of positive sort of vital institutions in your life, they can be at the very least just one hour of the day when it's not possible for you to do that thing, to be ruled by the dread or the anxiety because you're you're busy, right? You're trying not to drown in the pool as you're swimming laps. So you're not thinking about I'm I'm waiting for this report to come back and, you know, it could be really, really bad news. And then if it's bad news, then it means this and then it means this. It's like you're busy in a productive, healthy way. Um, you're also getting better. And, you know, there's all these benefits. But one of the benefits is you have some, you know, moment of stillness or presence in your life um, where you can't fall prey to those bad habits or that that thing that's that's worrying you. Yeah, and I don't think of it, you know, as distraction. Like these are genuine, like these are experiences that are kind of lifting you out of yourself. Like a study yes. just came out about why is it like we we all know that one of the best antidotes for stress and anxiety is doing something for someone else, but why? And it suggests that it's really because it does take you out of yourself. You know, when you are focused on doing something that aligns with your values, that also is beneficial to somebody else, even when you revisit then when you come back to whatever that thing that is bugging you or torturing you or upsetting you, you have a slightly different perspective. And that that's really, I think, the key there, because, you know, what's that quote, the, um, nothing is important as we're thinking about it while we're thinking about it. Yes. And that, you know, that, that just, it just, you know, it just becomes so big, that snowballing effect of that thing that you're thinking about while you're thinking about it is so important. And how do you kind of get that perspective and revisit it? And that's, you know, it's, we all know that people get their best ideas in the shower or walking in a park, like that that's when you're a little bit separated from it, where you suddenly have this clarity, this clear eyed way to see something maybe you didn't see before, to see an angle, to see an edge in, or to see a way to solve that problem. And again, it goes back to that idea of action. Like you're able to feel empowered. You've got agency there to have action. I always think I go back to self-determination theory, this idea that, you know, around well-being, that you need a sense of relatedness, you need a sense of competence, and then you also need that sense of autonomy. And when I think that's that agency and autonomy piece, like that sense where that you have some degree of control over it, reclaiming that is often when you take yourself out of it and then revisit it. Yeah, I, I, I was saying this at a, a talk I did uh, yesterday. Mm -hmm. Actually, I was speaking to this, this uh, recovery group and I was saying, you know, like as a writer, you have way more bad days than good days, right? Over the course of a book, uh, eventually you get enough good days that a uh, finished product comes out of the other side, but you have more bad days than good days. But as far as like running goes, I only have good days, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I always succeed at leaving my house to go for a run and coming back, right? Like I, so far I've always come back, right? Like, um, and, and, and the, the metric for what success is there 
is so much more in my control. It's so much more binary. It's like, did I do it or not? If I did it, I feel good about myself. If I didn't, I don't. I'm impressed that you're, 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 you always do get to leave the house. So <laughs> that's <laughs> impressive. Um, but, but you know what I mean? It's like, uh, you want to have things in your life that, um, where winning at them or feeling good about them is in your control. Things that give you vitality that are not like, like, look, I'm sure if everyone loved you and you were celebrated on every platform and media outlet every second, if you were getting nothing but good news, if your bank account was only going in the right direction, if your children were always behaving the way that you wanted them to behave, you would feel vital and like you were thriving and that you had the greatest life in the world. But that's not life, right? Like nobody gets uh, that many green lights. So you have to find things that are sort of vitality on demand, I feel like, that you I can love turn that idea. to. And that's sort of, I think, where hobbies come in, too, or just mm -hmm. things that we do for the, just the joy or the sake of doing them, that we're not moving the goalposts on, that we're not always trying to, you know, improve or enter that space of mastery or excellence, that they're, that they don't become our side hustle. They genuinely, we do it because we love doing it. And that's the purest form of love in, in a way. And I think the that we don't really allow for that in their lives. You know, I was interviewing somebody and she was like recently out of college and I asked her if she had any hobbies. And she looked at me like I was crazy. Like I was asking her if she like was a stamp collector or something. I felt like a really old like librarian, like back to the Dewey Decimal System. But the idea that there was something in her life that she was doing that was just fun. Like she was either like working or on social media or like hanging out with her friends. And that there's something to be said for like positive mediocrity of just doing things that, you know, you just do with a friend that are just fun, that are even easy to do if it is going for that run or, you know, maybe somebody it's, it, it can be even as simple as it, it's enjoyable. It might be like folding your laundry or just, you know, baking something or doing something in a garden, like just simple activities that are personal interests that are hobbies or something that you just do for the joy of it, that you're not getting better at. I, took up riding during the pandemic and I hadn't gotten on a horse in years and I'm really not good at it. And I, but I love it. And it's something that I try to do like once a week and it's really, really enjoyable and fun. And if anything's going on in my head beforehand, afterwards, you, you know, you, I've just been in like a flow space. You can't think about anything else while you're doing it. And like, trust me, I'm not going to the Olympics anytime soon, but it's just that the joy of doing something that is meaningful to me and that lifts me out of myself, that is something that, you know, it's the joy is in the doing. It's not necessarily an accomplishment. And certainly writing a book was the hardest thing I have ever done. I've written academic papers. I've written chapters in textbooks and, you know, nobody reads those, but this was really for, you know, they say like one in three people read an academic paper and that includes your mother. So this was like a way for me to reach many more people. And it was so hard for me to get it done and on top of life and everything else. And Angela Duckworth, who had written Grit, sent me as I was just in a hole. And I said, I just can't do this. And I imagined for Angela, when she wrote Grit, it must have been just a breezy, easy breezy experience for her. And she just, you know, one night decided to scribble it out and it was done in two weeks. And she sent me her original proposal and said, you have no idea. I cried every day for nine months and here was my proposal and it sucked. And, you know, actually and I opened up and it kind of, indeed it did suck. And like, it was so generous of her to share that, that experience with me. And I think sometimes we admire people and we sort of endow them with these superhuman abilities and that everything comes so easily to them. And I am so grateful. I like, have her email on my wall from that. Um, and, and to, sort of pull back the curtain on how hard she had worked in her like on this. And I'm a big believer in doing hard things and the joy that one gets from that desirable difficulty and everybody, I think benefits, even kids do from having some hard thing that they do that they're committed to. But it's also important to kind of balance that with stuff that's just fun, with play, with joy, with something that is just you're doing for the sake for the sake of doing it, not to master it or, you know, win an award for it. No, I think you may have been at the talk that I gave yesterday because I was telling this story about um, 
Winston Churchill, after the First World War, he, he discovers painting. Uh, he gets a children's paint set and he falls in love with painting. And he, he would later write this book called Painting as a Pastime. Uh, and he says, the first thing that a public person has to have, he says, is a hobby. He says one or two, and it needs to be real. Like it has to be a thing that gets you like active and doing something. And for him, it was painting. And I, I think about his paintings. Um, I believe Angelina Jolie just sold his most valuable painting. It was like 11 or $12 million. It's not a good painting. It's, it's a painting that is valuable because of what it allowed him to do, right? Like the art itself is secondary to the fact that it was relaxing and stabilizing and therapeutic and meaningful um, to a person under immense stress and uh, a person who suffered from depression, a person who saw the worst things that human beings can do to each other, you know, he he got something out of that hobby. And if you don't have one of those, ask yourself, where is that energy going? And it's probably going towards catastrophizing or turning it on yourself, you know, in some sort of negative way. Is running your version of that? Running is definitely, I try to run, swim or bike almost every day. And then I, I live on a, a farm outside uh, Austin, Texas. So there's always like, manual physical things that we have to do and animals to take care of. So it, it, it's, um, it's like, it's the opposite of what, like what I do is sit in a chair all day. So I want things that are the opposite of that. Right. And having even those kind of range of interactions, even with animals, I would imagine, yeah. you know, if it's with chickens or something that you're getting the eggs from, but that's sort of the idea again, that the joy is in the doing, it's not in the achieving necessarily. And how do we kind of bring that back? And it, 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 people say, well, I have no time. You know, there, I, there's no way, how could you expect me to, to have a hobby? And it was at Harvard um, Business School where they did a study looking at even employees who engage just 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and maybe it's like trying to learn a new language or doing something outside of that principal domain of where they spend all of their energy and how that, again, it was <laughs> revitalizing, you know, and I think so many mm -hmm. of the ways we use our time is so devitalizing and ends up making us feel worse. I'm thinking of Kelly Lambert's research where she, she we're not rats, but she studies rats and, and she would give some of the rats in um, her lab, they were given a Fruit Loop. And that's like their favorite thing apparently is to get this awesome Fruit Loop. And they're, they're they are just good. handed this Fruit Loop basically like on a silver platter and they get it and they're very, very happy. And then the other group of rats, she would hide the Fruit Loop under the bedding and they had to go foraging and dig it up and make, you know, and, and it was a process, an engagement of their bodies to go and retrieve this delightful treat um, for them. That was their delight hunting. And then she challenges these rats again and they're either put in a sort of swimming, um, like they have to swim through something. They don't really like to swim, but they can or put in a maze. And the rats who had to fight more and had to forage for their Fruit Loop, they were far more resilient. They tried much harder. They would work much, um, and they're much more persistent in going after the, um, the, their treat again that was now buried, though, on the other side of the maze. And she called the first group of rats her trust fund rats. Like, they were the rats who just couldn't, you know, they didn't know what to do. They'd always sure. just gotten that, like, yummy treat and didn't know how to handle it. But those who'd actually embodied, you know, and exerted energy in some way and been challenged in the past were able to then, in a new context, to rise to that challenge. And you know, it kind of reminded me, though, of how these stories we tell, like the story we tell really matters. You know, it's is what happens in life. It, it's not what happened. Um, it's what you remember. And the mm. stories we tell about things, I think the stories we tell about COVID, the pandemic, are we telling one only of trauma, that people are damaged, especially young children, that they are broken, that they are fragile, that they, you know, need to be spared all challenges, that we need to sort of walk on eggshells around them? Or are they also telling a story of what did they learn here? What did they, what would they advise somebody else in this situation? What could they, where could they add value? Is there something they could take away from this? 
And that dovetails with the, the research over children who know their family history, like the arc of, of life, like the, where their grandparents met, where their parents met, where their great grandparents hailed from. And they understand the challenges and they also understand the triumphs along the way. Um, and that recognizing that they aren't the centerpiece of this story, that they aren't the whole book, that they are part of the story of life was difficult, then it was great, then it sucked again. And seeing that arc, that those kids who understand that things can be hard, things can be good, and there's ups and downs, what they call the oscillating narrative, that those kids end up feeling more resilient when they're faced again with a challenge. They're not like the trust fund rats. Well, I thought about that during the pandemic. You know, um, when you talk to people who lived through the Depression or World War II, they're never like, oh, it was the worst thing that ever happened to me. I never recovered, you know, the whole rest of my life was downhill from there. I mean, obviously, there is such a thing as the survivorship bias, but like it was a transformative event. It was a formative event for them. And they're who they are today because of the, what they went through. And not only are, are you able to do that yourself, we should remember that like we're descendants. Think about the story you tell yourself. We're descendants from an unbroken line of people who have endured immense tragedy and difficulty and things that, you know, are 10,000 times worse than what we're going through today. So, of course, we have the skills and the strength and the fortitude to get through whatever this is. It might not be easy, but like it is possible. Yeah. No, and I, I worry sometimes about that trauma narrative that of of brokenness and fragility that if we're not also sort of looking at and not in a you know toxic po toxic sort of positivity way of just oh what are the silver linings again holding both and I think being able to see that both and not the either or yeah. and asking kids to even sort of, how do you tell this story? Like, how will you tell this story to your grandchildren about that really weird moment and helping them reformulate that? What advice would they give to somebody else going through that situation, you know, 50 years from now, God forbid, and turning them into givers of their experience rather than just receivers of help? Yeah. And that that's that's like the one thing that you control is the story that you're going to take from it. Like you you control you, you didn't control that it happened, but you do control what it means to you and, you know, what you're going to do next. No, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Well, this conversation was amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, I loved the book. And uh, Thank thanks so much for coming on. Thank you so much. What a pleasure. Awesome. Well, let me hit stop and make